Uh, good morning, Mr. McCallum, and good afternoon to everybody else. <laughs> Uh, and maybe good evening to anybody in the on on the eastern side. Anyway, welcome to this thirty second talk of the Rail Enthusiast Society. For the first time since we started our talks, we have a person from overseas addressing us. Uh, the person addressing us will be Mr. McCallum, and I'm may I request Mr. Tulia Sina to introduce him. Oh. Uh, I hope my screen is visible. It is. Yes, it is. But yes. it is not full screen. You're going to come uh, onto the. Yes, I'll, screen. I'll I'll put it on full screen now. Is that okay? Uh, no, you're showing no, not still yet. the presentation. Yeah, yeah now it's now, now yeah. Are it visible? Yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, good morning, Mr. McCallum, and good afternoon, everyone else. As Mr. Jail Singh says, it is my great uh, pleasure and privilege. to uh, introduce daud ali mccallum uh let me start with a little story uh 3 years ago when my son raghu he is the one on the right i'm on i'm the one on the left in the picture in the red t-shirt and my son is on the right uh he just started earning he's a he's a lawyer and he visited us in calcutta i work in calcutta he lives in delhi he works there so he came over and he bought a special gift for me and this is what that gift looks like now his his flight came in the middle of the night so when he came home i i woke up from my sleep and i was still a bit groggy and he gave me this book and it took me a while to figure out what it's all about well to to be very frank i i, I was still a bit confused about what it was about but uh, the next day i started reading this book and it was an amazing experience for those who have not read it it's the story of three railway experts from india who worked at the great western railway swindon works during the second world war now this could be a social comedy it's it's hard to say which genre it belongs to it could be a social comedy it could be railway fiction but for me as a professional railway man the most important thing was the details of railway working especially workshops because even if you find railway fiction it's about what we call open line working the working of the railways the actual running of trains from station to station but this was a book which focused on a workshop and not any workshop it was the swindon works and so much of it was familiar to me i joined the railways uh, indian railways in the 80s but what uh, this book described about swindon in the 40s much of it was familiar to me having worked having started my career as an apprentice in a railway workshop in the 80s and we have people in this group in this audience at present who have uh, who had joined as railway apprentices in the 60s so they would be still closer and still more familiar with the uh, with the ecosystem described in this book so i have the pleasure to introduce daud ali uh, neel mccallum his his name is neel but he his pen name is daud ali is a retired civil servant and he's the author of several novels set in india and african countries and for the purpose of our talk today he belongs his hometown is swindon and he calls this the place that welcomes embraces adopts adapts and survives i think that's true for all railway workshops <laughs> I, I'll remember uh, everyone to introduce uh, themselves. See much. Now coming to G W R Swindon Works, the Great Western Railway of UK, which was one of the earliest railways, it set up this uh, uh, this workshop in 1843. This was associated with the great railway engineer Brunel, and of course G W R's broad gauge, which was seven feet wide, and uh, the 
uh, the the rolling stock did not extend very much beyond the gauge. So Swindon had a local building capacity, a steam local building capacity of as much as three locos a week in the 1930s. And it is a historical fact that they employed many women during the 1940s when the world war was going on and Britain was short of uh, male, of male employees of, uh, of fighting age. And uh, then eventually it turned out Evening Star, the last steam loco of British Rail in 1960. Incidentally, the last steam loco of Indian Railways was called Antim Sitara, which means the last star. And it was turned out in 1972 from Chitranjan Locomotive Works. So I see a parallel here. And Swindon, unfortunately, closed down in 1986. But that's not the end of the story. There is a museum there which is called STEAM. It was established in the year 2000. And I have come across a photo of this museum. This is uh, Brunel, the person who was associated with the building of the railway, the great railway engineer. And here is a model of a seven foot gauge loco. You can see the huge width of the, of the uh, gauge and the fact that the loco does not extend much beyond this. So this is supposed to provide a very high level of stability, which is not there for smaller gauges. So let me share a quote from this book. This is describing, one, this is describing the workshop. And as I said, this is familiar to uh, all of us who have worked on railways in India. A vast estate of industrial buildings that had grown over time workshops, engine sheds, stores, offices, and warehouses, all constructed, repurposed, extended, or converted over decades to meet changing requirements and accommodate advancing technology. Almost all were built in red brick with gray stone arches, rows of lattice windows, and huge wooden doors. I just love this quote. And let me show why it means so much to me. Now, only one of these is Swindon. They look alike, but only one of these is Swindon. And let me share the names. The first one on the left is Swindon. The one to the right is BNR Kharagpur. The one on the left here at the bottom is RMR Ajmer. The one on the right at the bottom is GIPR Jhasi. All these workshops came up in the uh, latter half of the 19th century. Swindon, of course, goes back to 1843. These came a few decades later, but you can see the strong family resemblance. They could, they could as well be the same. They could as well be the same establishment. They're so similar. And of course, the resemblance is not just confined to the buildings. The resemblance goes into the, into the system, into the, uh, into the kind of work being done there, the kind of products being turned out. So that's why I say that I found this book very, very familiar. And uh, it was uncanny. I found it so familiar. So I'll not stand in the way of the, of the speaker today. So it, uh, let me once again welcome uh, Daud Ali McCullum to address us. And uh, the topic of the day is what makes a railway town. Thank you so much. Thank you for your patient hearing. And most welcome, Mr. V Mr. McCullum. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Sinha. I'm very uh, Atul, uh, stop sharing your screen, kind please. Words. Yeah. Mr. Bertel, uh, please share your screen. Yep, I certainly will. I would like to add a small point to what Atul Sinha had said. Uh, the Antim Sitara, the last star, the last locomotive was on broad gauge. Uh, there have been steam locomotives built in India on meter gauge and narrow gauge later. That's true. Yes, and I believe, and I'm talking to an audience which are all far more expert in this area than I am, but I believe Indian broad gauge was different to Brunel's broad gauge. Yes, yes, yes. Sir, make it right. screen, please. Uh, make, make it I screen. will indeed. Yes, thank you, sir.
Uh, one moment. Uh, we'll go in the view. The second last yeah. from the right. Second last column from the right. Uh, you are on file. Okay, 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 okay. View. Or slide, slideshow, slideshow. Basically, go to slideshow. Yeah, show. I was going to slideshow. Yeah, that's but for some reason, because... Yeah. Let me just bear with me for a second. No problem. Let me help you. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Welcome, right. Um, ah, here we go. Excellent. Right. Excellent. Perfect. Perfect. Well, here we are. Now, I'm going to aim to talk. I'm very conscious that this meeting started, like all good trains on Indian railways, exactly on time. And um, I will do my best to ensure that we keep to time. So I'll talk. Um, thanks to Mr. Sinha's excellent introduction. Um, there are some things I will drop out of my talk um, so we don't repeat them. Uh, my aim will be to talk for no more than 30 minutes, um, and I should be watching the time carefully, uh, so that we have plenty of time for discussion. As I say, I'm very well aware um, that I am talking to a group of far more knowledgeable people about railways than I am, uh, but I am going to claim uh, that I know a bit more about Swindon. Um, my history... Uh, with Swindon is um, my mother lived in Swindon during the Second World War. My parents were married in a church, which I can actually almost see out of uh, this window. Um, I've lived in Swindon for over 40 years um, and I worked in the railway works in the 1970s, but not um, as not for the railways uh, at that time. Uh, I was a civil servant and our office was moving from London to Swindon and we had temporary accommodation in the railway work. So I had the uh, honour of working alongside uh, proper railwaymen. Um, uh, but it was at that time a an organisation which was clearly coming to the end of its life. Um, the office which we built um, for the civil service um, agency that moved down to Swindon is actually on the railway site. Um, and I worked there through the 80s and 90s. Uh, my intention today is to discuss very briefly um, the Great Western Railway, the Swindon Works in particular. Um, I'll skate over the book, thanks to Mr. Sin has done a far, far better job uh, than I would of describing it. So I'll very quickly skate over that. But then to talk about what does it mean for a town to be a railway town and to pose to you the question of what is the legacy of a town being a railway town? And Mr. Sinha uh, showed us images of three such uh, works in India. And I, I'd be fascinated to hear what, as I've posed the question, what makes a railway town? Swindon uh, is at the heart of uh, the area which became the Great Western Railway's um, uh, area of operation. Uh, and the, it's at a time, uh, certainly in the late 19th century, uh, Britain was dramatically covered in railway lines. Um, I've included a an old map of the Great Western Railway system. But if you look at the map in the middle uh, of the number of stations around Swindon, uh, now of those, only two remain, Swindon itself and Chippenham. Um, so in Britain, we have significant numbers of disused railway lines, which are now cycle paths or areas for walking. Um, but there was a burst of railway building in the 1840s, 1850s. Many, many companies uh, set up to build railways. Many, many went bankrupt. Um, and that has left a mark all over our country, which remains to this day. And the railway network, although it is a fraction of what it once was, is still an incredibly important part of the country. Um, the Great Western Railway 
uh, the GWR um, was never short of its admirers and um, a sense of its own um, superiority and destiny. And GWR was meant to stand also for God's wonderful railway. Um, at the time that the book is set uh, in the 1940s, the vast number of independent railway companies that had existed uh, had been reduced to the big four, the Great Western Railway, the London, Midland and Scottish, the London and North Eastern Railway and Southern Railway, um, each with their own um, locomotive building capacity, rolling stock creation capacity. Um, and the area which the Great Western Railway served was in particular the southwest uh, of England, um, a very beautiful part of the country, uh, but also Wales and the Welsh valleys from which vast amounts of coal, uh, which all four railway companies used, uh, came. The legend of how Swindon came to be, the railway works came to be, um, concerns uh, the great kin kingdom Isambard Brunel. Mr. Sinha has already mentioned, you'll all be very familiar with his legacy, uh, and his chief engineer, Daniel Gooch, uh, the taller man standing next to him. The legend is that on a train journey back from Bristol to London, uh, Brunel said that uh, we really do need a proper railway works dedicated. Uh, and he was eating a ham sandwich at the time. And he said, right, when I finished as much of this sandwich as I want and I throw it out of the window, wherever it lands, that's where we'll build our railway works. Now, uh, you don't need to know very much at all about Brunel to know that a man of his absolutely obsessive focus on the detail of engineering would never have made a decision so significant um, on such a casual basis. But I have no idea what the origin of that legend is, but that's the legend. I don't think anybody really believes it. Um, the great benefit of Swindon is its physical location, um, its communication links, uh, and its flat land that the railway works were built on uh, with a regular and reliable water supply. And although the legend is far more sort of fun, I think the truth is far more the sense of the location. Swindon has existed as a town for many centuries before um, the railway works uh, were, or before railways were invented. Uh, the old town, um, which you see an image of that on your left, uh, is up on the hill. Um, and Swindon is um, a derivation of swine down. So if one wanted to be unkind about Swindon, one would refer to it as Pig Hill, uh, because that's effectively what the name means. Uh, it was uh, for many centuries, uh, a fairly sleepy and unimportant market town uh, dominated by one major family as many such towns were uh, in England. Uh, but we have a new town, uh, new in the sense of it's only 200 years old. Um, and that is uh, the railway works and the housing that went with it. And you see these are both modern images of two quite different areas of Swindon. Um, the hill between the two is a fairly steep hill. Um, and so people often tend to live and socialize in one or the other uh, of these areas. Uh, movement is not hard between the two, but it just tends to be that Old Town and New Town have a different culture. The extent to which that's about the railway these days um, is perhaps a moot point. But this is a, a diagram of the railway works, um, and uh, it really was vast. Uh, along the bottom, I don't know why I'm pointing at this because you can't see what I'm pointing at, but <laughs> forgive me. Along the bottom uh, of the image um, where the railway lines run uh, is um, the main line through from London to Bath and Bristol. Uh, the lines which swing up to the top of the image 
are running up towards Gloucester, Cheltenham, um, Worcester, uh, and the, the sort of lower Midlands. Uh, that line divides the two parts of the works. The part in the center of the image um, is generally um, the locomotive um, fabrication capacity uh, and shops there were given letters. So shop A, shop B, shop C, all with different uh, tasks. Um, the part over to the right part of the image was the carriage and wagons works where shops were designated by number. Um, all of this inevitably because of the quote uh, Mr. Sinha mentioned about areas being repurposed and changed. Um, this is not a completely accurate division uh, because bits of work, in it, as in any rail works, I'm sure, were fitted into wherever space was available at that time. Um, at the time of the Second World War, uh, then uh, bits of the railway works were used for uh, military purposes, uh, making armaments, um, building mini submarines, uh, and aircraft parts, uh, but that was a very marginal element of uh, the, the activity on the site. Uh, at its height, um, in the 1930s, the railway works employed 14,000 uh, employees. Um, the A shop, the main area for locomotion fabrication, uh, was at, at 11 uh, and a half acres. Uh, one of the largest covered areas in the world. Um, and I've titled this slide uh, Inside and Outside because that's very much how people um, of my mother's generation uh, defined uh, where they worked. And interestingly, I spoke to a gentleman well into his 80s now, uh, just a couple of days ago, um, who had worked in the railway works uh, and he was the first person I've heard for some time to use the expression inside. So he said, yeah, my first job uh, was uh, in a furniture factory, but then I moved inside. Uh, that was very much part of the language because a large wall surrounded the railway site, which still exists. Um, and the town was divided not only into old town, new town, but also inside and outside. And if you were inside, it was a job for life. Um, the Great Western Railway very rarely advertised for workers, if ever. Um, getting a job in the railway works was a very desirable thing. It was um, well paid. Uh, they tended to recruit from within families. So whole generations of, of men would work in the railway works. Um, it was a very Victorian employer, which we'll talk about more in a moment, um, but its health and safety record was absolutely shocking. Um, and I have a, a relative um, much older than me who uh, considered in the 1960s joining the railway works, um, had a day there looking at it and decided to join the army instead because he thought the British army even though there was action in uh, Northern Ireland at the time, would be a far safer place to be than uh, the railway works. Um, it always, but, but this concept of a job for life um, even applied to if you were unlucky enough to have lost a limb working in the railway works, you would still be employed for the rest of your working life somehow or other. And the Great Western Railway uh, would the Swindon Works would manufacture the artificial limb that you needed um, and maintain that. Uh, and I think this is um, shop number nine on the um, carriage and wagon side, which was uh, dedicated to making artificial limbs uh, for workers who had lost them. Um, so a vast uh, industrial complex, you can see Cutting across the middle of this image, the wall that I mentioned, which defined the difference between inside and outside. 
uh, and uh, the housing around it was built largely by the Great Western Railway uh, Company, uh, but so a lot also was private um, contractors taking advantage of the fact that there would be a large number of people um, employed in a very concentrated area. And it's in a street very much like the one that you see in this picture that um, Mrs. A's Indian gentleman is set. So just tiny amount about the books, as uh, Mr. Sinha said, it is set at the time when um, the uh, Second World War was in its fourth year. Uh, men had gone off in large numbers, uh, either volunteered or conscripted to fight in the war. Uh, women were invited and encouraged to come into the factories. Uh, Britain was heavily bombed um, and the railway network was, uh, not surprisingly, a regular target of uh, German bombing. And uh, the work which was done by uh, women um, with very little training uh, was really quite remarkable uh, and a real achievement, um, taking jobs which would have been thought inconceivable uh, without the situation of the war. Um, the picture in the bottom left-hand corner includes my mother um, in the 1940s in Swindon, uh, where she worked. She didn't work inside the railway work, she worked outside. Um, this is the premise of the book. We all know, this is quoting the um, chief mechanical engineer of the uh, railway works, we all know that tens of thousands of American troops are arriving at our docks in South Wales every week, being transported on our passenger trains to holding camps in our region. Yet more ships are offloading hundreds of thousands of tons of their equipment and munitions that our freight trains need to move. And when the invasion happens, perhaps a million men, Americans, Canadians, and our own lads, and all the material a great army requires will need to be shifted in an impossibly short amount of time to ports, docks, and harbors all over our region. All while we continue to run a full passenger and freight service whilst being bombed by enemy aircraft. A massive, massive logistical challenge. And um, the uh, plot of the book is that expertise was required to um, help that happen. And the three uh, Indian gentlemen uh, who are um, brought over to help, uh, one is Vincent Rosario from Bombay, uh, who is um, responsible for movements. And the inspiration uh, for this character um, very much came from the first time uh, back in, gosh, I think the 1980s. Uh, when I stood in Churchgate Station and watched the incredible rate at which trains were coming into and out of the station. Um, I think three minute gaps, which I thought was just inconceivable. And certainly I've never seen anything like that in any other country. And that thought of somebody who has the ability um, to move trains so rapidly um, over congested um, areas uh, stayed with me for a very long time. The second uh, of the three men is from Kolkata, um, a committed um, fighter for independence, uh, a dedicated communist called Dr. Akash Ray, um, a highly skilled mathematician uh, who is brought for his ability to develop coding, um, to handle the messaging and the communications uh, that this vast task will require. Um, his, all of these men come with different, uh, obviously different backgrounds, but different motivations for being uh, there. And the third uh, is Imtiaz Billy Khan, uh, who runs a type of engine called uh, a bulldog. Now, 
this is fiction and this part in particular is um i've taken some significant liberties with history here so um i have maintained dishonestly or fictitiously is a better word um that the um princely state of gwalia uh continued to maintain its uh independent railway um for a while after it had actually been absorbed by the bombay baroda and central india railway um and that um billy khan is the chief engineer the part about the engines called a bulldog although i don't think one ever ended up in in, in gwalia uh is actually true these were um engines designed uh well built in the just at the turn of the 19th and 20th century so 1898 1899 through to about 1901 uh, they had become obsolete in um, the 19, late 1920s, and they'd virtually all gone out of service uh, by the early 1930s. But as part of this need to replace destroyed engines and to build greater capacity, whilst the Great Western Railway was building um, newer engines, uh, it was also thought that it would be a smart thing to do to um, find any of these obsolete and derelict engines that were still around the system uh, and uh, to renovate them and get them up and working. And that's very much uh, Billy Kahn's role. Um, I said that everyone had different motivations. Uh, Billy's main motivation was one, uh, he loves working on these engines and two, the thought of working in a factory uh, full of women um, was something which appealed to a young man of uh, charm and enthusiasm. Although he discovers, I think, that um, the women of Swindon are perhaps not as sort of uh, naive as uh, he had hoped that they might be. Anyway, a lot of the comedy in the story, and, and Mr. Sinha is absolutely right, it is um, social comedy and um, quite deliberately so, uh, comes around the character and the adventures of uh, Billy Khan. And, uh, Mrs. A is Sally Atkinson, uh, their landlady, one of the few people who is willing to take on uh, three very different uh, and foreign characters to Swindon. Um, and uh, it is about their lives uh, living in her house uh, during the period running up to uh, the D-Day landings. They work in the Swindon Works um, and uh, they uh, have to deal with many problems. These are some images uh, from, um, I don't know if you have ever had the tradition in India, but there was a tradition, and certainly in my childhood, of both cigarette companies and tea companies producing um, collectible cards. And you could get the book in which to stick the cards and each time you bought, in this case, a packet of cigarettes. Um, then you'd get a different card and you'd built up the set. And this is one about air raid precautions uh, in Britain. And uh, we won't go through that in detail, but you can see this um, young lady dealing with an incendiary bomb, uh, cooling it down with a hose, putting some sand on it, uh, trying to get it into a box um, and then putting it out. And there is a history which i've tried to touch on a little bit in the book of quite remarkable heroism and quite great achievements by um, incredibly poorly equipped young women sitting on roofs uh in britain uh ridiculously poorly uh, equipped um to deal with uh incendiary bombs and dealing with them with remarkable success there are a significant number of historic buildings in London in particular, which would simply not be here now had it not been for just such people. Uh, and there was a big campaign to try and encourage um, beating firebomb Fritz, um, the, the incendiary bomb. And the picture on the right, again, my mother did this sort of uh, volunteering as well, um, is actually the woman with the stirrup pump is my auntie. Um, and they're demonstrating for a local newspaper how they would uh, put out an incendiary bomb. 
Uh, Swindon was very lucky to escape significant bombing. There were a couple of um, attacks, but uh, one of the bigger issues for our heroes in the story is the arrival of the Americans, and in particular, uh, dealing with uh, the complexity of America requiring um, the imposition of its own uh, form of apartheid between its black and its white soldiers. Um, and given that in this area in the southwest of England, the Great Western Railways area, um, there was a large concentration of American troops. There is uh, fascinating stories about how villages and towns, um, which were at that time 100% white British population, would be designated a black town or a white town. And only black American troops could be there or only white American troops could be there. Um, and... Uh, our heroes uh, have a bit of a run in with uh, some white American troops. And in Mr. Sin has very, very kind um, review. I think you make the point about uh, a railway union card being more important than the color of one's skin. Uh, and I think that's something that I felt very touched that you, you picked on, because I think that's a very a important point in the story. Um, my book is most certainly not the uh, first book about the railway works, that honour probably goes to um, this gentleman, Alfred Williams, uh, who wrote a book, Life in a Railway Factory. He worked in the railway works deeply unhappily. It's a very um, negative book about the railway works, um, but a fascinating character, a remarkable man uh, who self-educated whilst working in the railway works taught himself uh, French and Greek, um, was a great poet, uh, and during the First World War, uh, despite incredibly poor health, uh, volunteered uh, to join the army, ended up in India, uh, and as a result learned Sanskrit as well. Uh, this is a man with no formal education, uh, a remarkable, remarkable man. So let's talk about life in a railway town. Uh, this is an image of the Hooter on the railway works. And uh, there you can see the timetable for the Hooter. Basically, the Hooter would announce, time to get ready to go to work. You should almost be at work now. You've got five minutes left to be at work. If you're not at work, you are now late and your pay will be docked. Um, so throughout the morning, at the times you can see, the hooter would sound. Um, the hooter could be heard for miles. Uh, and this carried on until the works finally closed in um, the mid 1980s. And so um, when my wife and I uh, moved to Swindon in the mid 1970s, so the first 10 years of our life in Swindon, our timetable too was dictated by the Hooter. And that is a real aspect of a railway town that whilst neither of us worked in the railways, you know, you could literally set your watch by um, the Hooter. And, you know, it would be a normal thing for example, at the Hooter going off at five minutes past one for 12 seconds, you go, oh, is that the time? Uh, and very much part of the life of the town and very much missed, very much missed. Another part of Swindon and life in the railway town was something called the trip. The trip, um, which doesn't feature in the book because it had been stopped because of the war, was the first two weeks in July where the works would close down. And because uh, so many organisations either relied on the works or the people who were employed in the works, basically everything else shut down because there was no point you know, having a, a public house open, having a cafe open, having a shop open because nobody would be coming. So everybody in Swindon took their holiday um, in those first two weeks of July. Um, and the Great Western Railway would run free trains to seaside resorts. Um, and um, some seaside resorts for that period would become known as Swindon Beside the Sea because thousands and thousands of people from Swindon 
would would head off there. Um, in typical Great Western Railway style, this is a very paternalistic, very generous thing of the company to do. They say hundreds and hundreds of free, well, thousands, tens of thousands of free train tickets, um, but special trains being put on. Uh, but workers did not receive any holiday pay. So um, that two weeks um, had significant impact on the culture of the town, because not only was it the town entirely closed down for those two weeks in July, but afterwards, debts were significant, rents weren't paid on time. Um, so a very dominant part of um, the town's life, which again, it's all gone there. The Great Western Railway was also massively impressive in its education of its workers. Um, and this is the Mechanics Institute um, at its um, height on the left and tragically an image of what it is today, um, a wreck which um, it will just fall apart, sadly. Um, we should be much more proud of our Swindon railway history here than we are. Um, at its height, lending library, as is mentioned in the book, um, a full theatre. Uh, basically, if you wanted to learn about anything and you worked in the railway, the Mechanics Institute would arrange for that to happen. Um, bringing in lecturers, teachers, um, supporting all sorts of societies, uh, a really powerful part of railway culture. Something we've not really been terribly, well, haven't maintained at all well. Better is the GWR um, Medical Fund, um, which the Health Hydro, um, which it created, is still exists and um, was, again, typical of the attitudes of the railway in that um, working class people do not go to steam rooms and Turkish baths and things like that. But when this was built in the 1890s, um, that's exactly what was there and are still there and are run by the local authority. Um, even today, uh, those sorts of facilities are things which you would only find elsewhere in private um, hotels that you'd be paying you know, and gyms and leisure centers. Uh, and uh, it claims, or some people in Swindon claim that our National Health Service is based upon this model. Now, other historians point out um, that there's about half a dozen other places in Britain which claim the same thing. Uh, but it is no doubt that the uh, health insurance system and the fact that it didn't only cover the workers, but also their families, uh, was a model which was way ahead of its time when it was introduced and is reflected in our National Health Service. I thought I'd just very quickly, before I conclude, uh, touch on some of the great achievements of the Great Western Railway. Um, one of which is Box Tunnel uh, between um, Chippenham and Bath on the railway line uh, at uh, 1.83 miles when completed in 1841. Um, was the world's longest railway tunnel. And um, this is another legend, but this one seems a bit more true, but I think this is probably more to do with accident than design. The rising sun shines through the tunnel on one day per year, on Brunel's birthday. And uh, because of electrification, uh, the line had to be closed and a lot of work done. And... Um, it did actually cover Brunel's birthday. So for the first time, uh, people could actually test whether that theory worked. And they said, well, it, it almost worked. It almost, it's almost true. Um, Maidenhead Bridge uh, is another wonderful achievement, which people take completely for granted. Um, two of the flattest and widest arches ever constructed in brick, um, each with a span of 128 feet. Um, it's still uh, the largest brick built arch bridge in Europe, built in 1838. Every day I go to London, I travel over it, as do um, 
tens of thousands of other people without even being aware of it. And it takes the weight uh, and a trains moving at a speed uh, and frequency that was far beyond anything that could ever have been imagined and uh, is still going strong. Speed, uh, the Great Western Railway's Cheltenham Flyer um, covered the 77.3 miles from Swindon to Paddington in 56 minutes and 47 seconds, an average speed of uh, nearly 82 miles an hour. No other speed train has ever run from start to stop at over 80 miles an hour, either before or since. And interestingly, um, the journey time today, 90 years later, is just about the same, 52 minutes as opposed to 57 minutes. Uh, and uh, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Sinha, the uh, convert, well, the broad gauge, uh, which um, Brunel was very committed to. And this is a great achievement by the railway works. Um, in 18, by the 1890s, it had become clear that um, one part of the railway network running on a completely different gauge was causing massive, massive problems. Mm -hmm. And attempts to integrate travel um, were becoming so complex, you know, moving uh, carriages from one set of bogies to another, things like that. Um, so the decision was finally taken to convert the broad gauge uh, to standard gauge. This happened over one weekend, uh, 171 miles of route, 42 miles of which were double track, carried out by 4,200 employees of uh, the Great Western Railway. Uh, quite a remarkable, remarkable feat of logistics. Um, but this is another view of the railway, and again, from the book, and I think this would be something to consider whether this uh, is reflected in India or whether this is something quite different. Um, and this is uh, one of the characters in the book uh, talking, look at all the things the Great Western Railway Company does. In addition to maintaining thousands of miles of track, tens of thousands of units of rolling stock, thousands of motive units and hundreds of bridges and tunnels. They've got their own docks, steamships, warehouses, factories, houses, hospitals, hotels, and fleets of vehicles. They've even got their own airline, for God's sake. People look at the Great Western Railway from outside and see a vast but single entity, a coherently functioning whole. But it isn't. It never has been. It's a company that never set out to be so huge and diverse, but which took over hundreds of other operations, many of them specialized, and is still trying decades later to absorb them. That's why there are such a huge range of different engine types, a totally illogical spread of stations, and such a patchwork of workshops and depots. It's a mess, and no one seems willing to drag it into shape. It isn't something that has grown naturally and expanded to meet new demands and opportunities. And some elements of that can still be seen uh, in the railway works now. I'm sorry, in the, in the, the layout of the railway network now. Um, in Worcester, for example, there are two railway stations very close to each other for no logical reason other than they were built 150 years ago by different railway companies, um, Worcester Shrub Hill and Worcester Fourgate Street. And which trains go to what still remains something of a, a mystery. Uh, and you will find those anomalies and inconsistencies um, reflected throughout the railway network in the UK, even to today. So to conclude, the Great Western Railway Company still exists in name, um, it's the name now used by um, the company which has held the private franchise uh, since the late 1990s. Um, its network is uh, still significant, but a, a shadow of, of what it once was. Uh, but the fact that it's in private ownership uh, is a very complex arrangement in the UK with um, the companies which maintain 
um, the tracks um, and the permanent way being completely separate from those which run um, the rail services. And um, mm. we certainly haven't got that right in, in, in this country. Um, the Railway Works today, as Mr. Sinha mentions, uh, has Steam Museum, a uh, very impressive and very enjoyable museum to look around. Uh, it also has um, a designer outlet uh, shopping centre, um, which uh, is a major draw to uh, Swindon and um, uh, jams up our road system spectacularly uh, at Easter and Christmas time when people are desperately buying things. Uh, but a major generator of income to the town. And just to conclude, Swindon also had at its station uh, the world's first refreshment rooms. Uh, and uh, when I've been talking about the achievements uh, of the railway, um, I've been talking about the past. Well, this is something where um, history um, is perhaps uh, not as great. Brunel himself wrote a letter of complaint to the manager of the refreshment rooms at Swindon. Uh, I assure you that Mr. Player was wrong in supposing that I thought you purchased inferior coffee. I thought I said to him that I was surprised that you should buy such poor roasted corn. I do not believe you had such a thing as coffee in the place. I'm certain I never tasted any. I have long ceased to make complaints at Swindon. I avoid taking anything there if I can help it. Well, I'm delighted to say that um, the refreshment rooms still exist today. This was a picture I took a few days ago um, and uh, still offers a fine selection of uh, British delights, including, as you'll see in the sign behind, uh, my two friends, Helen and Raza, who serve there, a chicken tikka, Baji Baguette, which probably in a lovely way sums up change and continuity and all sorts of other things. So I will stop at this point and um, invite discussion questions, whatever. But I do wonder how long after closing a works does a town remain a railway town? As I mentioned, the works closed in the mid 1980s. Three quarters of the current population of Swindon are too young to remember it ever having existed. And so let me stop at that point with great thanks to all of you for joining us, to Mr. Sinha for proposing this, uh, Mr. Singh for organizing it, um, to Hatchet India for publishing the book, and to Preeta Maitra, without whom the book would never have been written, uh, Mr. Sinha, a fellow resident of Kolkata, uh, and to all of you. And at that point, uh, I shall stop and uh, hand back um, to uh, the chair. Thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. McCallum. It was delightful to hear, hear you speak of railway town because most of your audience today have lived in railway towns. Anyway, if there are any questions or comments, anyone, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, you can all unmute yourself. I have enabled that. Um, Shall I go ahead, Mr. Singh? Uh, please go ahead. Uh, first things, a wonderful talk by Mr. McCullum, most fascinating. And as Mr. Sina pointed out in the beginning, there's a lot of uh, things are common between railway workshops in India. In fact, uh, Jamalpur could always could al almost be Swindon in a different avatar. Now, I'll go in uh, uh, sequence. Gooch, Daniel Gooch. The days in the infancy of steam locomotives, everybody tried to invent his own valve gear. So, we had the Stephenson's valve gear and then the Gooch valve gear. And finally, because Doncaster was more glamorous, uh, maybe more sexy, Headed, oh. by, uh, <laughs> headed by Sir Nigel Grisley himself, who designed his own conjugate valve gear, which uh, his subordinates, I don't think they were very happy with it, but there it was. He was the big boss and holder of the steam record. 
the special class apprentices pre-war used to go to Doncaster for training. Then we come to uh, this picture that you showed of the bridge. There's a painting. I assume it is Turner's painting. Turner on, I think he called it rail, steam and speed or something like that. And the same theme was, um, you know, it was, it was uh, broadened by O.S. Nock in his book. It was called Rain, Steam and Speed or Rail, Steam and Speed. Anyway, that's in passing. Um, about the Americans. Uh, large numbers of American soldiers came to India <clears throat> because they were fighting in what they call the CBI, the China-Burma-India Triangle War. And they were billeted in uh, uh, cantonment towns like Merit, where one lady told my mother, she said, there there were these Americans overfed, oversexed, and over here. Because <laughs> so she had a baby of uh, teenage girls whom she thought she should protect from the Americans' uh, advances. So, uh, I think that's about all the conjugate value. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your patient listening. Mr. Michael, how, Apurva here, how, how were these places funded? I mean, the sort of infrastructure, this was so massive and there were four companies. How, how would they allocate funds for making such workshops and keeping them running? The number of manpower, salaries, equipment, uh, so... Have... I mean, they functioned very much as private companies. Okay. Um, uh, and um, both uh, passenger and freight traffic by rail was hugely significant. Um, so, I mean, it, it was very much as a commercial company. Increasingly, as you move through the 1930s, um, the direction of travel uh I think is fairly obviously towards a national railway service. And as you probably know, um, when uh, after the Second World War, we had a landslide election for a Labour government um, and uh, they were committed to large scale nationalisation, including the railways and Great Western Railway became the Western region of British railways. Um, and nationalization changed the funding model. And the funding model now is incredibly complex. Um, uh, our, sadly to say, the journey between Swindon and London uh, for the mileage of, as you saw, around about 80 miles uh, per mile, I believe, is the most expensive railway journey in the world. Mm. Um, it's ridiculously expensive. Um, and the railways still uh, rely significantly on government uh, support. So we have a very peculiar model. But in the past, it was very much based upon private commercial uh, processes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. McCullum, my name is Vinu Mathur, and uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, it reminds us of uh, many railway towns in India. Uh, some of them might be slightly bigger than Swindon. Uh, where these railway workshops are based, Jamalpur, Khadakpur, in the south, a place called Golden Rock Workshop. Um, it reminds us of those. But an interesting fact, uh, uh, the Great Western Railway was associated with Isambard Brunel. Now, I was surprised to find that Isambard Brunel was also associated with an railway company in India called the East Bengal Railway. Um, he never came to India, but he was sort of their consulting engineer and some of the designing of bridges and the alignment on the East Bengal Railway was done by Brunel. And I, I note his, his son wrote an autobiography, a biography of his father, which clearly mentions uh, Brunel's contribution to uh, the East Bengal Railway, although he did not live long enough to see the results. 
Yes, thank you. You're absolutely right. I think Brunel um, was consultant on a, a number of, of railways. And uh, yeah, that's that's very, very interesting. And the links, as you say, uh, when you look at a railway town, uh, and as Mr. Sinha said right at the start, the similarities are so great. And the culture of the railway does seem to be something, particularly between you know, India and Britain, uh, that translates very strongly the, the sense of what a railway town is and, and what working for the railway means. If I may, may make a few comments, uh, as mentioned by almost everybody, uh, there are a number of railway towns in India which remind you of Swindon. Uh, one of the oldest railway towns is Jamalpur, where I happen to have spent 10 years of my railway life. Now, the thing that st struck me immediately, which is common to Swindon, is the hooter. I remember selling my watch at, when I was at Jamalpur by the hooter that used to go off five or six times in the day. Hmm? The second is the annual holiday. Of course, oh. it wasn't in July. It was normally sometime in October uh, when there's a... Uh, massive puja in the eastern part of the country and the workshop closed down for about two weeks and just as in Swindon for uh, there was almost uh, no active activity except uh, that which was attached to the puja. The third thing that struck me was the medical facilities. There's a huge hospital run by the railways at Jamalpur and uh, that probably caters to even the non-railway uh, part of the city. Like in 1988 when I was there, there was a massive earthquake in Jamalpur. And the railway uh, medical facilities came into suffer even the civil authorities outside the railway area. One thing I would like to mention is, I don't think any railway town has closed in India. They have continued to be railway towns. So we can't really answer your question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's interesting what you say. Uh, well, all the things that you said, but about the hooter in, and the annual holiday. That's extremely interesting. Yes, and it makes complete sense. But uh, yeah, it's interesting that you have, oh, well, you are very fortunate that you you have that still. Um, you know, those that picture of the new Great Western Railway train um, is a Hitachi train built in Japan. Uh, we have, I think we still have Bombardier, but very, very little uh, railway engineering capacity left in this country, sadly. See, um, most of our railway towns remain railway towns because the locomotive works we converted to diesels or electrics and the carriage and wagon works have remained as they are. In fact, uh, the traffic has grown so much, unlike Britain, the railway traffic, that uh, we even added new uh, workshops and new towns, new railway towns. That would be an interesting subject for a book all by itself. What a new railway town would be like. In fact, that would be a great talk for the future. <laughs> Jelsa, can you tell me of any new railway town which has uh, come in, in India last 20 years? Which has been made See, for... Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, places uh, like Boravara, which, uh, you know... Yes, uh, let, me, let, me, let me interrupt. Yes, sir. Uh, bully. Bully, you can think of MCF. The modern coach factory near Raibareli, yes, which yes. is where we construct uh, new coaches. Yeah. That's come up in the last 20 years. But would you say it is a new town? Because Bareilly has been there. It is, it is a new town because this… this, oh, this it's not is, Bareilly. No, 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 no. It is it yes, is yes. located about 30 kilometers away from Raibareli. Okay. So, it's, it's self-contained and it will… Yes, yes. It's absolutely self-contained. Okay. And so, everybody who is… And, new... and Bela. Bela is another… Bela is, yes, exactly. Bela, Bela near Patna, yeah. where we have this wheel factory. Yes. That has come up in the last 10 or 15 years. Right. So we have examples, uh, recent examples also. Mm. No, the rail coach, coach factory at Kapurthala is also quite away from the old is Kapurthala came up in the 80s. But that came up in the 80s. In the 80s. That is about that's right. 40 years back. That's right. That's right. But we seem to be going towards uh, privatization. Uh, everything else is either, I mean, it's uh, huh? the railways <laughs> don't burn. So uh, the policy, the policy is still to keep it in house, but yes, uh, privatization is inevitable in the long run. Mm. Okay. And the thing is, when the first railway towns were set up, they were virtually virgin greenfield. Yes. Whereas yes. now, most of the new workshops and new sheds and the new depots that we are setting up are in big towns. 
and 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 uh, interestingly most of these railway towns began with the privately owned railway companies which were taken over by the government later mm-hmm. so the the trend has been first private ownership then government ownership and then again uh, gradually going back to uh, private ownership or uh, private public partnership in fact the railway townships and the town planning that went with it yes. because these were the first industrial townships in india yes. they yes. made may became a model for the new industrial townships for yes. steel and coal and that yes. came up in later years even the organizational structure of railways has influenced the organizational structure of many industries and i just like to make one more point uh, about the institute which you have mentioned we had a lot of clubs and institutes in um, uh, in our railway towns also and in jamalpur when i joined in the mid 80s there was a very active institute which used to have a movie show every week they had a swimming pool a gymnasium and all that and uh, in fact uh, mark twain has written about this mark twain came to india in the 1880s and he has written about the institute of jamalpur you talking about mark twain or rudyard kipling rudyard kipling also wrote about it i i think both 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 have written about this so there is a i, I just a clarification the the swindon institute that you uh, you, you presented was that a social club or was that a training institute there's often confusion between the two in india an institute is normally a social club where you have dances and tennis and swimming pools and so on and so forth but we also do have very fine training institutes uh, for example in jamal jamalpur itself so the one the picture that you the photograph that you showed was that a training institute or a, a social institute or combination um it was not a training institute in that this was not where um the GWR would train their staff to do some activity related to their work it was an educational and social institute so it had libraries a theater and would support a lot of clubs um i don't know if if membership of institutes in india would be restricted in any way to particular grades of workers but certainly the mechanics institute was very much um a sort of socialist principle of anyone who worked for the railways could automatically be a member of the library and and all of those things so it's educational and social the the institutes on indian railways are primarily for subordinate staff and right. the membership during the british period was of europe was of european subordinate staff and eurasians anglo indians we call them um uh, of course in later years for the indian staff they built separate uh, institutes um but well, you mentioned of uh, anglo indians a significant number of people came to swindon um in the early 1950s um from that uh, community and settled to work in the railway works if i may add to what mr mathur just said there were officers clubs mm. and they were for the highest uh, levels in the organization then there were institutes and some of them were specifically known as european institutes right. and that was basically for the european uh, for the european staff mm. in the records they still call european institute all right there is one in my neighborhood which is now rented by a bank okay so the jamalpur european institute was renamed as central institute yes that's right and the other one was national institute which was yeah, originally for the that was for the, the, that was for the workers the national institute yes that's right and the central that institute was, was mostly supervised by staff that's right sir and anyway, if there are no more questions and no more comments then we would like to thank mr mcallum for an excellent talk it uh, made us uh, very nostalgic about uh, the railway towns in india i mean uh, people like me are nostalgic probably our pillars in us still goes goes there <laughs> so it would be nostalgic anyway thank you very much sir and uh, our pleasure to have you 
deliver a talk to us. And I hope there are more talks by people like you in the future. Thank you. Thank you and very thank much. You to all participants. It's an absolute pleasure. Jail, sir, please send me the uh, email that comes for I, the recording. I do that. Yes, do sir. That. Thank you, sir. Okay. Close the recording if you can. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much.